we're going to discuss Newton's version of Kepler's third law, a derivation of Kepler's third law using Newtonian physics. But before we get into the mumbo jumbo, the equations, the constants, the variables, all that ugly stuff, we're first going to describe what we're talking about. Um, because Kepler's laws, they talk about planetary motion, the motion of a planet around a central object. So it's important first that we have a diagram that kind of depicts what is going on, because that is going to help us a lot with our derivation of itself. So let's start with a white orbit right here in the top right. And uh, it's kind of an ugly orbit, but it serves the purposes. And let's say we have a central object here, such as a star. And let's say we have an outside object, a little orange planet on the outside. And now these two things, this white dot in the center and this orange dot on the outside, could be anything. Um, this white dot in the center could be a star or a planet, and this orange thing could be um, either a planet or a moon. But for the purposes of this derivation, because we're describing Kepler's laws again, which describe planetary motion, we're going to assume that this outside object, this orange object, is um, a planet, and that the inside object is a star. And from this uh, diagram, little diagram itself, we can discern a couple of quantities that are, that are going to help us with our derivation. The first being the most obvious, the distance between these two things, the distance between the white dot and the orange dot. So we're just going to draw that real quick. And in astronomical terms, this is known as the semi-major axis, this is the distance between a planet and a star. And we're going to denote that as A, cap big A. The second quanti quantity that we can also talk about using this diagram um, is the time it takes for this little orange planet to go in a full circle around um, the, the star, the central star. And so that, in our, in our astronomical world, is also known as the period, P. We're going to call that P. So P is equal to orbital period. Now you may be thinking that, based on my diagram, I'm assuming that um, each orbit, or, orbit is circular. And they're not, if you're thinking that. Um, because most orbits are eccentric, they're a little elliptical in nature. Uh, but for the purposes of this derivation, because the calculations still work out very, very well, um, assuming a circular orbit, we're going to assume that it is a circular orbit. And our Earth itself actually is not very eccentric in its orbit, it's more circular in nature. Um, so we can assume that for this little planet here. So P equals orbital period. And what is so special about Kepler's third law is that it relates these two quantities um, in the following formula. And this is probably the famous formula that you know about. Um, it's proportionality that p squared, the period squared, the orbital period squared, is proportional, this is the sign for proportionality, to a cubed. So the period squared is proportional to the center major axis cubed. Um, now, this is sort of a, a rough a rough uh, proportionality. What we can do is we can make, make, change the proportionality to an equal sign. How do we do that? Uh, first, we have to understand the concept of proportionality. A proportionality assumes that if you multiply something, a variable, by a constant, then it, it will equal another uh, variable. So in this situation, our constant proportionality, what we multiply one quantity by to equal another um, quantity, is 4 pi squared over g times mass of the star. So we're just going to illustrate that real quick. So p squared is equal to 4 pi squared over g times mass of the star. Notice that we have an equal sign instead of a proportional sign now. And that is a cubed. So this is a little expanded version of Kepler's third law. And this is our constant of proportionality now. And so let's return to this graph here, this uh, little diagram that we have on the top right. And there's also one quantity that we can discern between these two. And we know from Newtonian physics that each object is attracted to every other object. Every atom is attracted to another atom, and every planet is consequentially att attracted to every other body in the universe. And so how we express this in Newtonian physics um, is in a very complex equation, in my opinion. F, the force of attraction between two objects, and we're describing the force of attraction between the star and the planet, is equal to, 
gravitational constant g times one mass, which will be our star, so mass of the star, ms, times the other object, which is our planet, so mass of the planet, mp, over the distance between these, these two objects squared. So as we see over here, our the distance between, between these two objects is the center major axis, which is a, so it's going to be a squared. And so we assume from this uh, graph as well um, in our derivation that this planet is in a uniform circular motion and that it is undergoing a centripetal force at all times. And this force can also be explained uh, with Newton's second law, which is force equals mass times acceleration. Force equals mass times acceleration. That's going to be our second um, big formula over here. So these two forces are equal to each other, and that is very important. And this is the centripetal force. So mass of the planet times acceleration of the planet. So this is very important because they're equal to each other, and we can do a little canceling out as a, as a consequence. So what we're first going to do is we're going to make these two quantities equal to each other and see where we can go from there. So let's see. MP, AP is equal to gravitational constant G times MS, mass of the star, times mass of the planet over A squared. And now what you immediately notice um, as I write this equation is that there are common variables on each side. MP and MP are both common. So what we can do immediately is we can cancel these out because we don't need them any longer. So say goodbye to MP and say goodbye to MP over here. And so what we have the result is AP is equal to G times mass of the star over A squared. This is our resultant equation. And this is important because when we talk about uh, a force, as we were talking about earlier, we also say that every force has an acceleration, and consequentially, every, um, every planet has an acceleration um, because in it, it is in a uniform circular motion. And so there's another formula that we can talk about in terms of the centripetal force, the centripetal acceleration that um, a planet undergoes as it orbits a star. And there's a formula for this. Um, it is expressed as acceleration of a planet is equal to V squared, V squared over R. So this is our um, acceleration as a result of our uniform circular motion. Uh, and we, this is a more of a raw, a raw equation. There's not much we can do with it. But once we discern a couple quantities from here, um, it, it'll be very useful. Um, so you, you might be noticing right now um, that AP and AP are on both sides. And so that will be very important as we go along in this derivation. But first, we have to focus on a few quantities in this equation. The first, uh, the first quantity we have to notice is V. What is V? What is our little V here? If you uh, remember from kinematics, um, V equals distance over time, DOT. And so we can expand the V a little further. In terms of our planet that is orbiting a star, um, the distance that it covers in an orbit, if we're um, assuming a circular orbit, is the circumference of a circle. And the circumference of a circle is equal to 2 pi r perfect and t what is t t is the time it takes um, to cover this circle and as we discussed that is the orbital period the time it takes to orbit so we're going to call that um, a i mean i'm sorry p we're going to call that p p is our orbital period um, another thing that we notice um, in this little equation is r. What is r? r is our radius of a circle, and as we discussed earlier, um, the radius of this circle is also the center major axis, which is a. So we're going to go a little further and call this 2 pi r a. Oh, sorry, 2 pi a, my bad. It's going to be 2 pi a. 
2 pi a over p. And so now we have a much, much friendlier um, equation in terms of uh, looking at our acceleration of the planet. So 2 pi a over p is equal to v. And so let's make that a little simpler down here in a different color. So acceleration of the planet is equal to 2 pi a over p squared. over r. Well, r is r. r, as we know, is a. So r equals a, and so we can assume that we're going to have a on the bottom, too. Right. So now, um, this is kind of an ugly fraction. It's not a fraction that we want to see because we have a denominator and the numerator, and, you know, that's just ugly, so we're going we're gonna to fix this up a little, so using a little algebra. So let's use another color yet again and say ap as we simplify this a little further, is equal to 4 pi a squared, 4 pi, sorry, 4 pi squared. Let's cancel that out. 4 pi squared a squared over P squared, A squared. P squared, A, my bad. So 4 pi squared, A squared over P squared, A. And now we can notice from this uh, little equation here that we can cancel out yet again. So what we're going to do real quick is we're going to cancel out the A's. So A gets canceled out, and then this squared gets canceled out. And so now we have a nicer formula. 4 pi squared a over p squared. And that is about as much as we can simplify it. And so now what you immediately notice is that we have everything in terms of um, our semi-major axis and our orbital period. And we have everything good in terms of this final derivation here of Kepler's third law. So now all we have to do is simply equate these two to each other, the a of the, of the acceleration of the planet and the accel acceleration of the planet here, and that will complete our beautiful derivation. So let's just make a little space here. First thing we're going to do is uh, switch colors. I love using different colors, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> um, so to attempt mass of the star, we're going to assume that AP is equal to AP. GMS over A squared is equal to 4 pi squared times our semi major axis over P squared. And now, what we can do in this situation, because we have a equal sign, is we need to cross multiply. So we're going to have 4 pi squared a cubed is equal to the gravitational constant g times mass of the star times p squared. And um, with a little bit of simplification, we can get to this final form here. So what we're going to do here now is divide um, by g uh, g times, ma uh, times mass of the star on both sides, and that will simplify things a little more. So we're going to divide by this, and we're going to get 4 pi squared over g times mass of the star times a cubed is equal to p squared. And to make this look a little bit, just a little bit more like what we have up here, we're just going to switch, uh, make everything on the opposite side. And this is going to be our final step. And 
so that will be this. And we have completed our derivation of Kepler's third law using Newtonian physics. I hope you guys learned something. If you have any questions, um, please feel free to put them in the comments below. Um, and I hope you learned something from this. Uh, I really enjoyed teaching it to you guys, and I'll talk to you guys in a bit. Thank you.